Good afternoon. I invite you uh, to take your seats and uh, we will begin the program. My name is Mark Goodman. I'm a faculty member here at UCLA in the Herb Albert School of Music in the Department of Musicology and Ethnomusicology and also a member of the Faculty Advisory Committee for the UCLA Allen Levy Center for Jewish Studies. On behalf of the UCLA Allen Levy Center for Jewish Studies and my capacity as chair uh, as holder of the Nikki Hansen Dow Chair in Jewish Music, I welcome you to today's talk by Lillian Wool, Jews, Music, Modernity, and Buenos Aires, which is part of the Lone Milton Fund for American Jewish Music Lecture Series. In fact, this is the inaugural lecture of the Lone Milton um, Fund for American Jewish Music. Uh, please join the Levy Center this Sunday, March 11th, 2 p.m., in the Young Research Library. There are these same debate cards that you can see the Sephardic Antique Roadshow, so I hope that you can uh, be a part of that. <laughs> I want to thank the Levy Center for making the arrangements of this event. They're wonderful partners with us, and we're so glad that we can uh, do many projects uh, with them. At this time, I ask you all to silence your cell phones for the following reason, that it's not, uh, you know, it's, it's what we do, and also, we are live streaming this event with the cameras in front of you. So just wanted to let you all know. So we welcome everyone here who's live streaming us on Facebook. The Lowell Milton Fund for American Jewish Music is a new initiative here at UCLA, and we endeavor to work on a series of research projects and performances of Jewish music. And we invite you all to find us on Facebook, simply the Lowell Milton Fund for American Jewish Music, and please like us on Facebook, and then you'll be able to get more information from us. So it's with great pleasure that I introduce to you Dr. Lillian Wolf, who is the inaugural UCLA Old Milk and Fund for American Jewish Music Postdoctoral Fellow. She received her PhD in Ethnomusicology from the University of Chicago in 2015. Her current book project, From Memory, Music, Temporality, and the Performance of the Past in Jewish Buenos Aires, is an ethnographic and historical examination of the sound worlds of Jewish life in Argentina since the 1990s. And this is an outgrowth of her dissertation research. Her research has been supported by the Chicago Center for Jewish Studies, the Center for Latin American Studies, and the Department of Music at the University of Chicago, as well as the Foundation for Jewish Culture and the Center for Jewish History. She served as visiting assistant professor at the David Friedman School of Sacred Music, a Hebrew Union College of Jewish Institute of Religion, from 2014 to 17, and as executive director of the Jewish Music Forum from 2015 to 17, and as co-chair of the Jewish Music Special Interest Group for the Society of Ethnomusicology from 2015 to 17. Dr. Wall is a member of the advisory board of the Jewish Studies and Music Study Group of the American Musicological Society, and has two essays published in volumes by Grill. Before I bring up Lily, I just want to say on a very personal note that I got to meet uh, Dr. Wool about five years ago when she was an advanced graduate student and some work that over uh, work that we did that really overlapped and it's been such a pleasure to get to know her over the last few years and we're really honored to have you here as our uh, as our postdoc. You really helped shape so many of the things that we do and welcome come and here at UCLA and you'll find Lily is a real genuine person, a wonderful intellect and a passionate scholar. It's a real honor to have an honor to you. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Lillian Wall. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Reverend Lillian, um, for that wonderful introduction. Um, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, thank you so much for being here today and joining me um, in sharing this paper and some of this research. Um, I would especially like to thank the Allen D. Levy Center for Jewish Studies for arranging this talk, Vivian Holmbach, Chelsea White, Larry Pinkerson, David Wu and Todd Kressner, as well as Lauren Black with the Milken Fund, and Mark Littman, like he mentioned, for many things, for his mentorship over many years, um, including in the next two hours serving as discussant um, today. I'm especially grateful, too, to the Lowell Milken Fund for American Jewish Music, for sponsoring this engagement and for supporting me as its inaugural postdoctoral fellow. 
The Lowell Milken Fund for American Jewish Music is a special initiative that does the very important work of supporting new creative endeavors in Jewish music research, scholarship, and performance. I would also like to thank the Department of Musicology at the Herb Albert School of Music, and to extend my many thanks to the Jewish Music Forum, a project of the American Society for Jewish Music at the Center for Jewish History, for co-sponsoring and live streaming um, this talk through, through their Facebook page. In addition, I would like to thank a lot of you who are listening to the website, especially the great music that collaborate with me and share your stories, your music, and your stories. Thank you. Thank you. In this talk today, I begin by addressing the impact of the 1994 bombing of the Asociación Mutual de Vita Argentina, Piami, Jewish Community Center and Mutual Aid Society in Buenos Aires, to bring into focus the negotiation of Jewish Argentine belonging in the wake of this tragedy and the emergent practices of sonic recontextualization of Jewish music in the aftermath, including the renewal of music in Jewish Argentine cultural life in the decades after the bombing. Through a discussion of a handful of musical case studies, I argue that Jewish music has emerged in Argentina as a contemporary genre of creative and cultural significance in connection with the memory boom, the explosion and proliferation of scholarship, discourses, practices, and performances of memory since the 1990s, following the return to democracy after the last military dictatorship in Argentina from 1976 to 1983. As a historical period and in the wake of the Amish tragedy, Jewish Argentine cultural production expanded in a new direction, and Jewish music has emerged as a genre and a social practice, generating value for Jewish Argentine expression, cultural history, and embodiment in Argentina and beyond. On July 18, 1994, at 9.53 in the morning, a car bomb detonated in front of the Amia, killing 85 people and injuring over 300 others. On that day, historical records held in the archives were destroyed or scattered, and the edifice was reduced to rubble, ushering a new period of Jewish Argentine history, defined by impunity, the collective demand for justice, and a growing antipathy toward institutional and governmental bodies handling the case. Emerging in the days, weeks, and months following the attack, the commitment to memory as a political endeavor, a cultural value, and a Jewish Argentine moral imperative were soon expressed in performances of solidarity and social mobilizations for justice in the streets and the plazas of the city. Just two years after the 1992 bombing of the Israeli embassy that claimed the lives of 29 people, the Yami attack was clearly recognizable for its targeting of Jewish Argentine. The ruins of the Yami demanded reconstruction, and cultural labor and memory work provided the space and means for debate, a way to reflect on as well as to re-engage Jewishness and Jewish Argentine identity within the political frameworks of discourses of the nation pushed to their limits. Reconstituting collective and cultural memory from the rubble was not a wholly systematic effort, but one in which scholars, artists, politicians, journalists, archivists, administrators, youth, volunteers, Jews, and non-Jews have launched new political sensibilities, artistic stances, and cultural practices to assert Jewish cultural expression as a vital form of symbolic capital performed to anchor Jewish embodiment in the experience of Argentine modernity as an expression of self community, and nation. In this talk today, I address the process of rebuilding and cultural renewal in Jewish Buenos Aires that took shape through the efforts of different actors, organizations, and individuals who, through discursive and performative practices, asserted memory to demand justice. In the last decades of the 20th century, as Argentines continued to contend with the long shadow of the human rights abuses of the last military dictatorship, 
Responses to the Amiya bombing emerged during an historical period of transition from, as Gabriela Ceruti argues, <coughs> stage two, the theory of national reconciliation, an era of executive pardons and national forgetting, transitioning to stage three, the memory boom, and a return to remembering as a political public act. <laughs> Amid and within the memory boom, Amiya memory emerged as the catalyst for cultural renewal, and as a vehicle for political mobilization in Jewish Buenos Aires. The activation of memory mobilized large sectors of the populace, but the questions of what to remember and how were still up for debate. For instance, in the immediate wake of the Amiya bombing, and in the absence of a broadly recognizable Jewish Argentine musical repertory, approximately 150,000 people gathering on July 22, 1994 to protest terrorism, collectively sang Hatikva, the national anthem of Israel, in the first large-scale public demonstration in Argentina after the army attack. For a grounding cultural dissonance, rather than coherence, in an act of unisonance, this enactment presaged the painful confrontation with tensions surrounding the perception of Jewish Argentines as foreigners and the public process of othering that made Argentines Israelis in spite of their citizenship. Amid fears of repeated attacks, public calls by non-Jewish neighborhood associations to new synagogues, Jewish schools, community centers, and sports clubs to peripheral areas of the city compounded by Jewish Argentine concerns of repeated attacks, too, forced the question of Jewish belonging into national debate. Famously, television personality Mario Tonelli's reference to Jews and innocent victims, and former Argentine President Carlos Menem's public condolences to then-Israeli President Yitzhak Rabin, puts a fine point on the situation of confused citizenship. In the face of serious contestation over Jewish Argentine national belonging, cultural expression took on an even more profound significance in its capacity to represent the community and the nation. And the aural, that is, as Jim Drubnik um, notes, the acoustic as simultaneously a site for analysis, a medium for aesthetic engagement, and a model for theorization, publicly began serving a privileged role in political demonstration and private expressions of grief to respond to the attack both within and beyond officially recognized forms of commemoration. For instance, in December 1994, Argentine celebrity musicians collaborated with Amiya leadership and curator Elif Kapsuk to organize a benefit concert that featured legends of Argentine rock music, the national music of political resistance including the musicians pictured above, Frida Pines and Luis Alberto Spinetta. <coughs> in addition, adult Yiddish choirs such as the Mordechai de Virta Choir, formed in 1995 under the leadership of Rachel Starker, a beloved Yiddish teacher in the Ikuf, the Yiddish Kultur Farband, Jewish school system, certainly <coughs> participated in public protests each Monday morning in the Plaza La Vache with the group Amoria Activa in front of the Supreme Court Palace building. At the height of its popularity in the early 2000s, the Bibirza Choir had around 250 members, and the repertory consisted mm -hmm. mostly of Yiddish partisaner and folk song. The duo of Sergio Lerner and Marcelo Molilevsky also formed around 1995, and they, as well as other artists, and writers and musicians became a part of the efforts to demand justice in collaboration with Memoria Activa and their project, the Latin Junto Memoria Activa. Um, bringing later on a new talk, I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about some of their experimental music that they've contributed as well to the scene. A study pertaining to Jewish Argentine identity forced the public confrontation between ethnic difference and national belonging. And after the new Omnia building was finished and re-inaugurated in 1999, a series of conferences on Jewish culture called Recreating Jewish Argentine Culture, organized by historian and novelist Ricardo Firestein, 
and U.S. American Literature Professor Stephen Seagal amplified these conversations and supported the conditions for new experimentation in the Jewish arts, as well as historical studies of the Jewish cultural past. In December 2004, a special conference organized by conductor Mario ben Sacri was held on Jewish music. In a publication from the conference, Contribution of the Jewish People to Music, musicologist Edmund Segrusi squarely places global discourses and debates about Jewish music in Argentina, arguing that the perception of the authentic in Jewish music as that which is ancient is actually a modern project of asserting value in and of Jewish music. Differentiating between the scholar's job and that of the tastemaker, Sarusi recognizes that the term Jewish music is embedded in fraught debates about value and aesthetics in Jewish cultural and religious tr tradition. In pursuing the study of the uses of music and Jewish music in relation to Jews in modernity in Argentina, I argue that solely addressing these concerns within debates about cultural appropriation, hybridity, and diaspora are actually incomplete. Historiographical considerations of Jewish music and the contextualization of Jewish musical practices in Argentine history illuminate important context for the modernization of Jewish music throughout the Americas. Furthermore, approaching contemporary Jewish musical performance in Buenos Aires from an historical and an ethnographic perspective underlines the critical role in musical in critical role of music making in Jewish social life and the oral practices enunciating Jewish musical modernity there. Ethnography allows us to take note of the symbolic and economic capital accrued to Jewish music and performance. And for me, this opens up new paradigms for investigation grounded in the challenging theoretical work on Latin American modernity by scholars such as George Yusti, Nestor Garcia Caclini, Beatrice Sarno, Julio Ramos, and Ana Maria Ochoa Since many Jewish Argentines engage with music that might be considered localized from other geographical or temporal sources, I listen to Ochoa Tia's discussion of processes of sonic recontextualization in Latin America in reference to the study of Jewish music in Buenos Aires to understand Jewish music making as a dialogical process of self and community making. Her work theorizing how epistemologies of purification, which seek to provincialize sounds in order to ascribe them a place in the modern ecumen, and epistemologies of transculturation, which either enact or disrupt such practices of purification, are tensions and cultural processes of sonic recontextualization that are in many ways central to debates in Jewish music scholarship. As Sochno Otie argues, given the ubiquity of globalized music translating the local to the world stage, musical hybridities have been so profound, profoundly standardized that this once privileged discourse is no longer exceptional. Rather, she states, we need to consider a genealogy of histories of recontextualization that involve different forms of production of oral textualities. And these oral textualities as constitutive, specifically, of all modernity. In so doing, I have recognized that recontextualization of Jewish music in Buenos Aires in the 1990s, emerging during the memory boom, corresponds to Ochoa's observation that these processes necessitate the fundamental reconceptualization of the role of the temporal and spatial dimensions of the sonic and their existential and epistemological significance under the changing technological and social conditions of the globalized world. In some ways, this is actually quite a vast departure from the existing literature on Jewish music research. As Philip Bowman notes in his entry in music in the Oxford Handbook of Jewish Studies, Jewish music research at the turn of the 20th century had experienced and undergone a process of pluralization, which recognizes the presence of various forms of Jewish identity and non-Jewish identity in music. A postmodern turn in scholarship that accommodated <coughs> a, quote, previously unimaginable plethora of Jewish identities at the beginning of the 21st century. The question, however, of how to move beyond discourses of hybridity and its proliferation of hybrid subjectivities, as well as out of celebratory essentialist discourses, 
is not an easy process. Thinking through my case study, with an ear to sonic recontextualizations privileging of temporal and spatial considerations, helps me to place Jews and Jewish music within discourses of race and ethnicity as a way of examining these historical tensions related to Jewish Argentine belongings since 1994. In my research conducted primarily between 2010 and 2014, I noted that the performance of, for example, the same Freilach or Bulgar or Chestnut of Yiddish folk song in Buenos Aires is not just a simulacra of North American Jewish musical revivals within the relatively small Buenos Aires Jewish music scene. And the disparate approaches to musical innovation hardly satisfied the definition of a conservative revival of heritage music. Instead, performing Jewish musical repertories in contemporary Buenos Aires does the important work of providing the means both, quote, both to hegemonic groups and to popular sectors to take possession of the benefits of modernity. For instance, in the following two examples, I'll get to some music finally. In the following two examples, by the Trio Lenetsky and the Joe Leonard Mogilevsky, you can hear some of the experimental sounds of Jewish music's modernity in Buenos Aires. Um, given time constraints, I'm unable to sort of get into a longer discussion of these tracks, um, but I invite you all to engage in your own sort of close listening um, of the practices to hear and maybe sort of tune your ears for some of these practices and processes of recontextualization exemplified in this track. <laughs> the first track that I'll play in a second, the Lenetsky Trio, produced by the Institute for Jewish Music, begins as a tango and develops into a wolgar through a shifting rhythmic foundation tied together by melodic variation and embellishment. Thank <laughs> you. 
Aleph by Cesarella and Marcelo Bielski is from their 2010 album on Fed. The looping passages of the semi-chromatic repeated motif of C, C sharp, B flat, A, G, A, B flat, C sharp, D, which is actually on the front of a coupled with the alteration between sparse and then more thickly textured chordal structures, supports the reiteration of melodic fragments in the clarinet and right hand of the piano, which creates a sense of temporal instability. In Allah, we might be going somewhere, but we always return back to something that changes, as new spaces of sound open up in each direction, pass upon pass unfolding, like the Argentine writer Jorge Luis Borges' famous story of El Allah, influenced by his interest in the Kabbalistic writings of Gershon Sholem and Joshua Trachtenberg. Perhaps you can hear the Allah in Cesar Lerner and Marcelo Mogilevsky's track, a musical opening to, quote, a place on earth where all places are, seen from every angle, each standing clear, without any confusion or blending. A play about the first three minutes or so, um, it goes on over six minutes, and I think we'll move on to the next section of the talk. commonly as Buenos Aires, is in fact two distinct geopolitical areas. The first, Ciudad Autónoma, um, is the most densely populated area and home to 2.9 million residents. And two, Buenos Aires Provincia um, is the greater expansion, home to 15.6 million residents, according to 2010 Argentine National Census data. Um, in a city, you know, compared to New York City, the po where the citywide poverty rate was 19.9% in 2015, the geopolitical entity of Ramon Sinus 
had a 32.6%, so much larger, percent poverty rate in 2017. While different geopolitical designations are commonly used to refer to the city of Buenos Aires and its surrounding areas, the term Gran Buenos Aires actually describes both the connection in the two parts, the city of Buenos Aires and 24 partidos, or neighboring districts that border it. In total, 9.9 .9 million people live in the area of Gran Buenos Aires, or approximately 25% of the entire population of the country of 40 million people. Argentina's population, government resources, and political power remain centralized in the port city. As Jewish immigrants arrived to Argentina in the 19th century, the first minion was organized by a group of German Jews in 1862, who later formed the Congregación Israelita de Buenos Aires Synagogue, later re inaugurated in 1897 as the Congregación Israelita de la República Argentina, which is um, well known today, commonly referred to as the Temple Libertad for the street that it's on. Western European, German, and Alsatian, as well as Central European Jews, made up the first wave of Jewish immigrants to Argentina before the turn of the century. Sephardic Jews also made their way to Argentina during the late 19th through the mid-20th century, century, primarily from North Africa, Turkey, and later the Middle East. Today, Sephardic Jews represent a smaller proportion of the total Jewish Argentine population, and East European Ashkenazic Jews outnumber Jews of German origin. As of 2005, Argentina had the largest Jewish community in Latin America, and was the seventh largest Jewish community worldwide after the United States, Israel, France, Russia, Canada, and Great Britain. A demographic study published in 2005 also shows that around 244,000 people in Buenos Aires report either matrilineal or patrilineal Jewish descent. In service to this largely secular and progressive community, musicians coming from these backgrounds and contributing to these social worlds common and personal connections to Jewish identification, not only through fields of religious expression, but also through the categories of heritage, culture, ethnicity, nationality, and um, community. Constructing an understanding of Jewishness in Argentina that exists as simultaneously real and also imagined, converting many past and ethnic identities onto contemporary music. <coughs> as a point of sort of, um, Clarification, the notions of tradition and religious among Jews in Buenos Aires have slightly different meanings than in the U.S., as anthropologist Fernando Fishman has argued. As he states, the word tradition, tradition, and its derivatives function as a mode to indicate change, that is, that which is characterized as traditional is representative of that which varies. And Fishman further explains how religion and tradition are understood as forms of Jewish Argentine embodiment in ways that are distinct. Quote, the notion of tradition constantly comes up in conversational discourse as a substitute for religion. In general, it affirms that the home, the family of origin, is not religious, but traditional, or that the person is not religious, but traditionalist. The difference is established based on knowledge of Jewish religious rules, and the observance of difference opposes these rules to include a serious of obligatory religious practices, whereas tradition would not be coercive and would leave room for those uses to be reformulated. As such, it manifests the conscious decision to continue with certain practices, but stripped of their religious mandate, causing religion to be relativized and tradition to be separated from religion as a cultural practice of another order. The meanings of tradition and the uses of traditionalist, as in I'm a traditionalist, in use in Argentina, differentiate Jewish Argentine cultural practices and religious practices of faith and fidelity to institutional Judaism. Yet both trajectories maintain important continuities with imagined Jewish immigration stories and the past in the 20th century. Performance forms provide especially public sites of negotiation of these values, and bands like the Orchestra Cap, who I'll discuss in just a moment, um, assert traditionalist aesthetics, even as they often provide a musical experience for the religious sectors of the Jewish Argentine collectivity.
So if you can imagine for a second. Seated in the open air on a warm summer evening, in the Plaza Oriental de la Puda de Argentina, in the upscale Palermo neighborhood on December 21st, 2011, I watched from the audience area as the band took to the stage, 10 musicians in total, playing trombone, trumpet, electric keyboards, saxophone, hand percussion, drum kit, electric bass, electric guitar, congas, and vocals. Under brightly colored spotlights, the band warmed up the crowd with a few tracks as well fill it up from the machine on the stage and the screen behind them flashed the words, La Fiesta de Hanukkah, or the Hanukkah party, Hanukkah holiday. Wearing their usual band's uniforms, a long-sleeved Kelly Green button-down shirt under a black tuxedo vest, black pants with a black baseball cap featuring the cap logo embroidered in white thread, I listened as the band completed their soundtrack before breaking out their first set. The Hanukkah concert organized by Chabad, the local emissary of the Chabad Lubavitch, featured the orchestra caps, thickly textured, percussion and bass driven, Latin Americanized, mostly Hebrew language um, music, incorporating Migunim, wordless melodies, to foster art audience participation in songs with lyrics in Hebrew and Yiddish. The band belted the hooks and familiar refrains to their audiences, who mouthed along to vocables like oi, 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 and kef, kef, kef. Their short set opens up the beginning of the concert as the MC cut to announce the band and declare enthusiastically, no hay fiesta judía sin música. It's not a Jewish party without music. Our kef to kef played through a few upbeat tracks many utilizing familiar melodies such as Handel's Hallelujah Chorus turned upside down into a Jewish motif with the saxophone Melissa launching into a cantorial wail. And the band's energetic rock sound, replete with the three-person three horn section, is typically further intensified by the visual stimulus of choreographed and improvised movement, such as jumping and bouncing up and down while playing their instruments. I remember that Gaston had told me that he studied cinematography in college, and I thought about how this training contributed to the staging. After the public lighting ceremony of the menorah, the bands returned to the stage and were joined by Kaufman Do, an all-male percussion samba hate ensemble that takes its name from the language of a small Afro-Brazilian community in Sao Paulo State. In 2011, Ezekiel Schusterman, a member of CAF and one of the co-founders of Kaufman Do, wanted to do something special for the Hanukkah party inviting Kaufman Do to do a guest set with Kef. Priding itself on being especially adept at navigating the boundaries of religious and non-religious publics, traditionalist publics in Buenos Aires, um, the band is engaging for both the religiously mixed audiences, participating in public holiday celebrations, private ceremonies, as well as life cycle events. As the six Kaufman Do drummers assembled on stage, lining up in their green and orange teeth, t-shirts in a single row in front of their band leader, the bands together launched into a cover of Brooklyn Orthodox rabbi and composer Mordechai, Mordechai Ben-David, um, his tune Ma'aminim from his 2001 album Ma'aminim B'nai Ma'aminim, creating a call and response exchange between Orchestra Kef and Kaufman Do that took advantage of the popular song form to add an elaborate percussion solo during the middle eight section. Um, rising up to the tonic with each stanza, stanza ending in a two-measure percussion break before the start of the, the next refrain. It appeared that the refrain was largely improvised by Kaufman Do, and each player attended to his own drum, striking their different sides had pinkes and sordus in interlocking rhythms as the band leader pointed to a featured soloist while marking time. The drums were mobile, strapped onto the bodies of the male percussionists, with leather belts hanging around their waists. So I'm a little bit like this. Oops. Oh, 
In the United States, there are thousands of klezmer bands doing the same thing. No, they're not doing the same thing because the way we work is very different. Because we have Argentine roots, Latino roots, with the mix of what our country has, just like most countries have a mix. We're mixing the local stuff more and more often. We don't just make klezmer, we make Jewish music. Another musician who initially started exper experimenting with Jewish sounds and customer repertories is Simcha Dukal, a musician who has also since moved beyond these sound worlds and into others. Simcha Dukal seems to a popular audience, bringing attention to Jewish musical genres and everyday lives of progressive, largely secular Jews, who comprise the majority of today's Jewish population in Argentina. On the surface, his opinions about Jewish music are flexible, given a healthy dose of humor and irony. But in fact, his ideas about Jewish musical performance are firm. He views Buenos Aires as a place of musical opportunity, unlike New York, for example, where a wide range of global musics are already firmly rooted in the local musical scene. It's a carrot, he says to me in English, as we share a coffee in a little cafe near his apartment in May 2013. A carrot, I ask? And he explains, Spanish. You can do anything here. African music. Do you know what Afrobeat, for example? If someone to come here, I mean, there isn't much black or African culture in Argentina. If musicians came here to make Afrobeat, it would all be new. You can do anything because we still don't have it. It's like horror movies. There aren't many horror movies in Argentina. You can do anything, and that's the carrot, you know? That you can do anything. Imagine 20 years ago, or even now, that there's no klezmer in Argentina. So I start making klezmer and suddenly run a role, and I'm doing something not most doing. Now there's a culture that goes along with that. People are interested in whatever's foreign, whatever's new, etc. For Dukov, Argentina is still a place of possibility and reinvention because of the scarcity of resources and the lack of creative rigidity when it comes to innovation. The city of Buenos Aires is a place where new scenes can form around the localization of new creative industries. And Jewish music can emerge through experiments with Jewish repertories and performance practices, resounding in afterlives that form the building blocks of Jewish musical education and expression of ethnicity in Argentina. Dukov's aesthetics point to one particular strategy for moving in and out of Jewish musical modernity, what he calls a time machine, challenging the sounds of Jewish music's person in time. He takes his music seriously, understanding that it is a material cultural product, but a product deeply tied to the desires and fantasies of social collectivities, as well as circulations of racial and ethnic stereotypes. In my case, he says, it was a constant search to understand my identity, and for many people, you see, they search in the past, <coughs> but I think this is an error. My truth is the search for identity in the past, the present, and the future. The following musical example shows how Dukov draws from the transnational Jewish musical past in his interpretation of Jankoya, a Yiddish folk song about a, a town in the Crimea, now in Russia, seized from Ukraine in 2014. It's a showy tune with a twangy guitar riff and pop cadences, describing the story of Jewish agricultural life and farm work in the 1920s during the early Stalinist era. The song memorializes a small railroad depot in its lyrics that explain how to arrive at this place and what you should expect to find there. While controversy about the song's historical origins persist, scholars such as ethnomusicologist Abigail Wood have instead focused on the place of Jankoya in the contemporary Yiddish song repertory. Oops. Placing the song in the Jewish socialist tradition Wood identifies its leftist, progressive, secular politics and socialist origins, which resonate in the Argentine past where socialist Zionist, socialist, and communist ideologies were prominently represented by Jews in Buenos Aires in the early decades of the 20th century. The landscape of the Jewish Argentine left was culturally and politically diverse, stratified between different groups whose ideological approaches to versions of Zionism, nationalism, and Jewish Argentine ethnicity often clashed with each other. It is difficult to hear Dukov's updated version of Jankoya without an ear to the history of the Jewish left in Argentina and the collective memory of Baron Maurice Hirsch's Jewish colonization agency programs that established agricultural colonies in the interior provinces for Eastern European Jews escaping from Brahms. 
The following lyrics illuminate this point. Aunt Natasha drives the tractor. Grandma runs the cream tractor. While we work, we all can sing our songs. Who says Jews cannot be farmers? Spit in his eye who would so harm us. Say John Koya, John, John, John. Not only does Dukov's update to the original musical material immediately change the sound of contours of the song, while creating a possible musical index linking the song to a specific part of Argentine history, but Dukov's musical choices also give the song a particularly modernized feel through the inclusion of form, voice, and synthesizer samples. So here is a little video for it too. towards my concluding thoughts here. Um, when memory emerged as a powerful tool to respond to the Amyabani in 1984, it extended a path already forged the decade before. Linked to discourses of pluralism, national belonging, American the Jews, the Holocaust, the military dictatorship, and the reconstitution of democracy and human rights, memory has contributed a modern identity for Argentina repositioning Jewish Argentine belonging as thoroughly national and a part of modernity. Memory cultures provide sonically or socially embodied discursive spaces to practice, perform, and to re-embody Jewishness in Argentina, allowing memory work and musical labor to supplement the voids left by the attack. From memory, as a set of historical parameters, contemporary Jewish musical engagements in Argentina emerged during the 1990s to reshape notions of Jewish Argentine ethnicity, showing how Jewish music has been deployed as a musical genre to connect local musicians to global circulations of music and performance practices. To conclude, I'd like to return to this anecdote about Hatikva, sung in 1994, because in 2018, the Jewish Argentine community finally has a communal public anthem, the song La Memoria by Leon Hieco, which is often played or sung at the protest memorials convened by different groups on the 18th of July. The anthem is a commercial pop ballad, basically the we didn't start the fire of human rights atrocities throughout Latin America. And very little that the song is far from authentic or so-called traditional Jewish music, the city of Buenos Aires has embraced it nonetheless because of its clear enunciation of national solidarity and the confirmation of Jewish Argentine belonging through the imagined musical nation. Today, the song lyrics are tiled on the walls of the redesigned subway station at Amia Pasteur Station, a monument to the memory of the 1994 bombing, affirming Jews as Argentines, and the lasting image of Jewish Argentine sound rising through memory. Today, my intent was to not only bring into focus the sonic textures and historical origins of the recontextualization of Jewish musical sound since 1994, but to extend conversations from Latin American studies and hemispheric studies to a critical approach to American Jewish music, reframed as Jewish American music, as a means to more clearly articulate Jewish ethnicity and American citizenships. Moreover, I challenge the uncritical usage of the term America and American Jewish studies 
focused mainly on the United States, one part, but not all, or the entire entity of America. As performance studies scholar Diana Taylor argues, America, Americas, and hemisphere are terms not for places or for objects, but for practices. And there's a relation between how one lives in America and the naming and conceptualization of the field of study. From this wider vantage point, we not only learn about the spatial and temporal dimensions of the sonic landscape of Jewish music in a city like Buenos Aires, but such an approach makes space for more critical and even comparative examinations of Jewish musical practices in the United States and the transatlantic routes of Jewish immigrants leaving Europe, North Africa, and the Middle East for an imagined America. By extending the aperture of a scholarly gaze to include places like Argentina, Latin America, the Caribbean, and Canada, in the contemporary area, era, excuse me, not just as a footnote, we are able to examine Jewish musical practices through a critical lens that includes race and ethnicity, placing Jews within ongoing debates addressing coloniality, transnationalism, and decolonial thought challenging cultural studies today. Thank you. So we, uh, I want to leave time for some questions to get really, well, to, um, let me just transition. Um, first off, thank you so much for the wonderful conversation with the uh, really self a very new world to us. I just want to start off by um, framing three questions. Um, the first one, maybe you can tell us how you got into this topic. And um, I, think, I think that would be something that people would be interested to know. My second question, I'll label as a Jewish question. <laughs> Which is, uh, what was it like musically and culturally prior to the individual? We alluded a little bit to um, how much of the, um, what happened in 1984 was, was uh, predicated by uh, the previous decade. But um, is this a new concept of tradition that they have? How does, how does tradition work? And my third question here is a musical question. Um, I'm just going to pick out one. You can say this about all of these four examples. The uh, Nuevas Ares Plesma, um, which is just a fascinating you know, sonic example of the rhythm uh, that you really describe. I guess I have, you know, Klezmer ears, so I hear Klezmer yeah, uh, in it. Um, and I'm just curious, what other Argentinian, excuse me, musical styles um, do you find that are part of this in, you know, how are, you know, what are the sort of like the aesthetic, you know, conflicts and solutions? Thank you so much. Mike. Okay, so I guess the first question is how did, it, how did I end up here with all this material um, and giving this talk to you pretty much? Um, so I guess I was originally interested in the Caribbean and Cuba, uh, but with American citizenship, it's very difficult to travel and do research as a smaller place. So I started to expand some of my thinking in, to other parts of Latin America. The Southern Cone is very different from the Caribbean. Um, region. It's very different. And so I wanted to go somewhere where I could meet people, where I could go and access institutions and archives and see performances of music. I think as ethnographers and as archivists working in other parts of the world, this is, you know, typically a useful a useful strategy. So I ended up in Buenos Aires where I had never been. Um, I knew very little, I'll be totally honest. And I went and I sort of ended up trying to go to the Anya to use the archive there, the Central Park Archive, the archive where um, much of the historical records are still are still housed there. They also have a theater in the basement, so you can go see performances. And so I kept going back, right? It's both the archive and the ethnographic field site. And so some of this work just kind of came out of there. Um, the memory studies piece Kind of filled in through the ethnographic research, and it was something that I kind of had to start to deal with. The resonances of the past kept coming up, and those pasts don't stay in the past. And I think this is what happens when you have these traumatic political histories, where you know after I think I have this slide and this timeline of history and memory and forgetting, and so this 
this need, this political need to refer back and to bring it into the present, to build a future that's based on memory and remembering, um, this kind of all came out of really the field work itself. Um, which kind of takes me to the second question about history. Um, in the archive then itself, I've encountered a number of wonderful documents and recordings and things, um, both in the Fundacion Ivo, which is the <coughs> Latin American, or well, the Argentina Buenos Aires branch of Ivo. Um, they have an office there with records and recordings, things that have come from the US, from Israel, um, and from other places that people brought with them, a lot of LPs and other oddly sized sound recordings, sound recordings that were made on wire, which I hadn't been aware of as a practice at the time, but a number of sort of discourses, <coughs> um, sort of spoken word. Um, and so there's a ton of materials that sort of date back, I guess, in publications I've seen the term Jewish music used about as early as maybe 1925, some choral societies that took their names from some of the St. Petersburg folk music society folks. So they end up merging, the first one ends up merging with um, the second one, and they be, all become the Yol Engel Society, actually. And so they're interested in classical music and in folk music. But they're also interested in sort of establishing a space for music, just generally speaking, in communal life in the 20s and 30s. Um, and as the decades kind of pass on, I kind of read through the, the um, records, uh, the labels and the backs and the stories that are associated for information and I've talked to people, some of the Khazanim who uh, had escaped uh, Europe and who ended up singing in some of the congregations in Buenos Aires. There are some records and materials from them, and we've looked, we found a couple of books, we put some books in conversation with each other, published in Canada, in the US, and in Argentina, that share these different stories and sort of redirect the portrait of these biographies of these people um, for each different uh, sort of area and region of the hemisphere. Um, so these stories are all kind of connected together in a sense, and um, towards the end then of the 20th century, from what I understand, someone told me that you know, during the dictatorship of English language um, music was banned, and so there was a rise in popularity allegedly of um, Israeli pop music, uh, because it's in Hebrew, and then also um, there were golden ages of you know, cantorial song, about 1980s from what I understand, the Latin American or Jewish studies uh, starting to Form um, in Argentina, and so all of these things are kind of coalescing um, similarly. But you know, I, I'm kind of focusing on this '90s point of time, in part because of how my research kind of came together. Oh, and the musical question. Um, there are there are a number of different musical materials that people sort of recontextualize, and um, besides the tango, which is you know a very famous one, and an easy one because there's a Jewish history with the tango as well. So Jewish musicians were involved in um, the recording industry. They were involved in um, their performers and musicians and dancers. Um, and Yiddish tangos were written at the turn of the 20th century, and tangos in Russian and in Polish um, that were performed and sung within the community of immigrants at the turn of the 20th century. Um, but then other forms, like quartetto, which is from the north, and, um, cumbia, there's a lot of cumbia for those of us who listen to a lot of Latin American music. Uh, cumbia is the genre that really moves all around Latin America. Um, it's very popular. Um, what else have I heard? I mean, there's folk music traditions, rock. Rock is one that actually gets used a lot. Um, and a lot of musicians contribute their time, especially some of the celebrity musicians. Um, have contributed their time and that their sort of uh, cachet to um, the Omnia um, cause. And in 2015, I kind of alluded to it in the last slide, there was a benefit music video that circulated that was eventually awarded um, a musical prize by the uh, country's uh, music awards uh, organization, and it was also awarded a prize in recognition of, of its work um, by the Latin Grammy Association. So. There are, there's a number of different sort of musical uh, textures that, that get sort of folded together. 
So we'd like to open up the floor to anyone who has a question. Okay. Um, I, I understand that um, with the <laughs> bombing at the Almeida in Buenos Aires, that um, there was a concern about the destruction of many community records or some community records. I, I'm curious, um, did you have any opportunity to inquire into that or did that influence in any way either be I went into the field not really kind of knowing what I was looking for. Um, so in a sense, not finding, I couldn't not find what I was looking for. Um, so what I did, you know, it was passed along to me were things that, that were there. And sometimes memories of things that, you know, people would recall that they had a personal collection um, in their homes or in, the, you know, in their own possession. I, you know, I didn't get into much of sort of the the rescue effort, but the rescue effort included rescuing the documents <coughs> of, of Jewish history, and so a lot of people were were involved in that for quite a long time as well. How significant is anti-Semitism in Argentina today? Ooh, that's a tough one for me. Um, I. I guess generally speaking, I'd say Argentina has been a place with a few exceptions um, that has been a comfortable place for, for Jewish individuals, for the community to be. I think what was so shocking in 1992 and 94 really was this specific targeting, these anti-Semitic you know, targeted acts against the Jewish community. And part of the cultural renewal really came from the sudden need to address one's own individual and one's group's collective Jewish identities in, in public forums and in personal ways. So, <laughs> you know, in, in general, it, it doesn't, it's a tricky question because now there's a performance, there are performances of security as some, as some uh, for instance, Latin American Jewish studies, anthropologist Natasha Zaretsky, and others have noted every time you go to a Jewish institution in those areas, you can usually visually identify it because there will be what's called a pilote or um, like a big, uh, um, I don't know, like a large battery. No, um, a center. Ball arm, yeah. I'm just sorry, it was a uh, baller, you know, like yeah. the truck stoppers? A truck stopper, yeah. exactly, yeah. so that nothing can drive into the building. Um, and so you can see where all the institutions are. Security measures have um, impacted the visual landscape. They are also sites of memory and practices of memory. Um, but generally speaking, I think you know there are other places where anti-Semitism, active anti-Semitism throughout the world are, are probably more um, more of a concern in the everyday. It's been a bit. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. I bet you had a wonderful time here. I've been, and it's a great place, very, very rich here. Um, when you were showing you know, the different uh, aspects of music, tango, of course, the tango is a great influence. Then the Western, Israeli, and then the last one, Serbian, Bulgarian, Croatian. And the other thing is <coughs> that the terrorist attack was proving that it was performed by radicals from Iran. And there was one guy who was investigated in the case, the woman's side of the allegation who was murdered by the government. But anyway, coming back to the music, uh, really very interesting because whatever you are Jewish or Italian or French or Irish, you take a different the music. The local music, and then you integrate it to your roots. That's my question. Is that what's happening? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm trying to kind of understand that. Um, in I don't know, in, in through some of the writings of this um, ethnomusicologist on our talk, who um, has written about these sonic uh, recontextualization processes. So, She's really kind of dealing with some of these transculturation. So the 
fact of you know culture not just being something that we take through assimilation processes, but you know giving back, <laughs> putting out there, and, and to the national culture too. Um, and then these purification processes that want to kind of corral a certain type of thing and make it a thing, so that Jewish music is a static thing that has these sonic features. Well, we all know that's just not really the case. It, it's always fluid. It's always changing. Um, people have different attitudes. Writers, folklorists, um, scholars are have their impact in sort of shaping notions of, of what these things are. And so, so absolutely, yeah. There's a lot of different things happening in Cuba. In response to the first question about the loss and the bombings, uh, the National Yiddish Book Center in Massachusetts has a very large collection, and they were able to replace uh, considerable uh, amount of the library that was destroyed. Uh, it wasn't entirely covered because their the interest in local Argentinian um, I think was modest on the part of the book center. And I wanted to ask, aside from that, two names that come to me readily when I hear about um, Argentinian Jewish community and music are two celebrity personalities. One is Daniel Barenboim, the symphony and opera conductor, and the other one is the very successful composer, I forget his first name, Goliath. Yeah, it's Oswald. Oswald. Oswald, yes. Do you know? Have they, in any manner, contributed to the Jewish community or, or concerts? Not that I've seen specifically, uh, or I haven't really looked specifically at some of the classical and art music scenes in, in, in their own sort of popular way, but last year, um, Daniel Barenboim was in one series and he was doing a big Daniel Barenboim was in one series doing a big city concert series um, with the Pinus and Marta Garage. And so the whole city was really excited. And many concerts were staged, and a lot of people went to went to the concerts. Um, and with respect to Osvaldo Goliath, I, I saw in the Duke archive of the Marshall Meyer records and papers, there was a letter of condolence to um, uh, about Marshall Meyer after his passing, I believe, to his to his wife, and um, it was from the father of his father, Goldenhoff, actually, from what I understand. So I haven't seen a whole lot of discussion about sort of Jewish Argentine roots or intentional projects that are engaged with, you know, contributing to or um, dealing with Jewish Argentine identity per se. Um, but they are two very famous famous individuals. And, um, who have had spectacular music careers, absolutely. You mentioned the name Martha Arbor. Uh, does she speak from Jewish background? I'm not sure. I really okay. Was it the Alan Levy Center that there was the Argentine consulate about 10 years ago in presenting a Lecture on the Jewish influence in Argentina. I don't know. I wasn't here. Well, you weren't Well, there was a wonderful presentation, mm -hmm. and I don't remember whether it was the Lincoln Center or the Department of Musicology or whatever, but maybe there is some. Well, I think we have confirmation. It was the Lincoln Center. It was the Lincoln Center. Yeah. It was the well, maybe in its archives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There is a video of that presentation which you might interest in. Yes, young lady in the back. I want to thank you first for your very eloquent and interesting presentation. And I realize that this may be beyond the scope of your paper, but I'm very curious that in your research and in the, um, you mentioned the rock bands that are 
devoting popular, uh, popular political resistance music to um, look at the role of the Jewish community in Buenos Aires society. But does any of this address the dirty, the dirty wars that were in 1970, 72, and the role of the Jewish population in that? I haven't gotten into that area of study. I really, I haven't. It's a long question. Right? Yeah, it's a time period that I don't entirely understand. I work with more of the residences and the memory discourses that kind of stem out of that period of time. And I have wonderful colleagues who write on that period of time specifically as historians. Um, and I, I haven't engaged much with music and culture during that period of time. Thank you. Yeah, it should be. Um, so my question is actually somewhat connected to that in the sense that um, it seems that you're saying that in this case uh, it's through memory specifically connected to acts of violence that the sonic transfiguration happens. Um, and maybe I'm a little bit incorrect in that. But thinking about, because I was thinking in your articulation of this modern Jewish uh, Argentine identity um, that is would be the transculturated practices. What are the, the what are the purifications that are now being brought back together, right? But you also mentioned how both, in, like in the case of Argentine rock, this is articulated as a specifically Argentine identity through rock, but also Jewish musicians are also playing rock, and there's so many different genres. That are happening, and so I was thinking about how how are you thinking about that when there's this multiplicity of genres that have these multiple references? I don't know if it's a bad idea for this, but my a kind of related question about that was: are, is, does this have to do and, and and kind of the creativity that these musicians uh, bring have to do with the kind of pushback against the tango machine, as Morgan calls it, and and this articulation of Argentine national identity? Tango and that kind of tradition and heritage. And there's another question about politics and that, but I'll use that for a little bit. Yeah, so let me start maybe by addressing. So, yeah, more in the first book, Tango Machine, his work in culture renewal and um, renovation. I mean, it really does parallel. I, I thought about it a lot as I was doing field work and trying to figure out, you know, what am I dealing with here with, in terms of sort of Jewish collectivity? <laughs> And in a way, I guess I find myself in a place where I'm arguing that these Jewish musics are genres, right? Um, they're like practices, but they're also a constellation of different um, interconnected sort of sounds. Um, and maybe that helps me to move to the next stage of thinking. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of different things moving around. And so I guess if, if we're, we're going to stick with the, you know, memory creates this opportunity for these sonic transcultural processes to happen that unite both collectivities and individuals and project it out into the nation. Um, then these purification processes I've been thinking about really come from in a lot of ways. Now, similarly, not the folklorists, but the Jewish music tastemakers and scholars, right? So people who need Jewish music as a value to be doing something, whether that's being authentic in some sort of way that's tied to the ancient past, um, whether that's Jewish music that needs to sound Jewish in the, you know, I went to second model kind of Ashkenazic way, or in some imagined Sephardic or Mizrahi Middle Eastern kind of way. I think those are kind of the tensions that I'm eventually going to try to get at. Um, and I welcome your help and assistance over the next period of this Yes, sir. Um, one of the groups that emigrated in the early part of the uh, 20th century were women from Eastern Europe who were either brought specifically or tricked into or because of poverty wound up as prostitutes and brothels. And I understand that they had created a subculture of uh, written material memoirs and including songs and songs particularly songs for children. I know it's a different time frame, but I wonder in the archives whether you found anything about this or whether that memory resurfaced in any way into the time period you're interested in. You know, there's two things to respond. Um, one is that I found that in the gendering of some of these repertories and musical practices, uh, most of the musicians I talked about today were all male. A lot of the women that I've interviewed and spoken with in documentary shows and performances, they're tango singers. 
Um, and I don't know how that maps onto different time periods or you know, whether it's the sort of Rafa era um, of the mixing and the age of immigration in the 20s or you know, that sort of ethos and nostalgia um, and types of musical spaces that are being sort of recounted, maybe even reclaimed. Um, but, but that seems to be something that's happening, um, a pattern that I've noticed. And with respect to specifically music, the only song that I've, I've encountered at this point is in the Ruth, one of Ruth Rubin's treasuries of Yiddish folk song. Um, it's a 1955 recording that she made of a man named, I believe, Harry, I forget his last name, but it's from Montreal. Um, and it's right? So under the sky, from the fairy. And it's a really, it's a, it's a terrifying song. It speaks about, from the per point of view of a woman looking out, seeing the sky, but being imprisoned in the white slave trade as a prostitute. Um, and there's a recording of it that I think is up on the Evil Lawrence Lambert site, a Swedish song of the day, if you're interested in listening to it. But it's absolutely a terrifying, you know, very scary, actually, first person perspective. To what extent is Ladino culture represented in the work that you've done? In the stuff that I've done? Um, very, I've done very little, and that is something that I should do more of, and I think we have UC Ladino next week, if I'm not um, incorrect, and um, Adrian Nabrowski will be here next week, who is an expert on the subject. So, yeah, but have, do you know how it exists in, I mean, is it more folk, traditional, less of a pop? Because the, much of the Sephardic community, to my understanding, that's located in Caracas, um, in the south um, east part of the city, and I've walked around, but it's Orthodox. Um, and so it would be very difficult for me to access. Um, I don't know anything about the liturgical music in practice, and some of the concepts that I've seen or, or heard about, there's some of the sort of standard mythologized tropes of Sephardic and and a Spanish past, and maybe some of the exoticization of you know, medieval, um, medieval Spain. Um, but I haven't really dug. I haven't really dug too far into it. Um, yes. So you mentioned one uh, one uh, hop out group being a band that we don't we don't just do Jewish music, which is what they were doing. It's that they only do. Plasma in the U.S. and what they were doing sounded pretty similar to a lot of things that were happening in the U.S. at that time or earlier. Could you speak to the extent to which the musicians they were aware of or might have been emulating similar developments that were happening? Yeah, thanks. Um, I guess well, that was a cover, right? Really, what they were doing with uh, Mommy. Um, it was a cover, and it was a totally different arrangement in a lot of different ways. And there are certain similarities um, to the sort of rock pop ballad um, of that type of um, Mordecai and David style. Um, and beyond that, the, the orchestra that I think I mentioned, it's just one of a number of different bands. They had a lot of rotating. Bands. And now they've started the Institute for Jewish Music in Argentina, which is an educational platform, um, as well as an institutional organization that supports and helps to get funding, some city funding, that now has just been approved for the whole nation from the Cultural Archive, um, Heritage Archive, more or less is what it could be translated as. Um, and so, there are definite similarities. There are things that some of the bands and some of the tracks that map more closely as covers, and other pieces that sort of depart a little bit more. But their aesthetic, to me at least, is more of the wedding band aesthetic. And so they are actively circulating and performing in different life cycle occasions. Um, and so I've seen them at a you know, bar mitzvah, they play weddings, they were actually um, uh, on a television show, a very popular television show in about 2012, and they were the wedding band at the Jewish wedding. And so that's kind of more where they, that's their repertory, and that's what they're, <coughs> those are their gigs. And so the material kind of stays within those, within those repertories. I just asked a question. Yeah. 
Are you a musician as well as a historiographer? I played the oboe for 12 years. Okay, he has the last question. Uh, Tim Kadukov, pretty interesting guy. His self presentation, there's a whole lot there. But his, like his mustache is soft for Dolly, but he's also for Zappa. But also, I mean, what's really interesting was that, that in, the, in the band they had dreadlocks, which is, you know, Jamaican religion. I mean, um, did, did, did he talk about Rasta? You know, did he talk about some kind of pan American Rastafarian meaning or anything like that? Um, I'm not sure if I have this quote. I think I had to cut it out for time, but your book that I wrote, I published an essay um, in one of these real volumes about this. And I talk about some of his music through the lens of cosmopolitanism and eclecticism and within the framework or the context of the world music market. And so there's definitely, I mean, it's an aesthetic. It's received differently in different countries. Um, and it sort of plays with and plays upon some of these different stereotypes um, and symbols. And, you know, one of the most important things, too, is, you know, let's ground this in Jewishness. So there's a, there's a Star of David necklace, too. Um, so there is this, you know, it's a, it's a push and pull. So uh, the big thanks again to Dr. Lily Wolf. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you all for coming. Again, a special thanks to Emily for giving some of your studies for hosting us in this lecture. And a big thanks to Dr. Lori Black, who's in the back, who really helped us study in the books. Thank you very much. Thank you. This is very special.